issue came up because other people that I talk about who have fellowship with folks who uh, who embrace the Torah. And uh, so whenever you have people who embrace Torah and lean towards the Old Covenant, they they lean towards an emphasis on the Old, co- old Covenant stuff. Um, it introduces some challenges and things that uh, need clarification. So uh, apparently some of them heard some of my preaching on the dis- this distinction I make between the law of Moses and the tables and the commandments of God written on the tables of stone because I do make a clear distinction because the scripture makes the distinction and even Jesus made the distinction himself as, as I'll point out but it gets in, it can get in, involved so I'm going to start talking about it and I won't I definitely won't get finished it's a con, it, I'm going to try to get comprehensive Lord willing I might stay on the subject for a couple of weeks I can't promise you that because I often say that and, and never follow through. But, yeah, okay. Anyway, so to start with, let's look at the idea of law. Just the word law, L-A-W, law. <laughs> All right, that is a pretty general word, law. It's just like the word work, W-R-R-K, work. And you get into all this controversy because... Depending on where you see the word work and what context it is, or and, and you know what, what kind of work are we talking about, it could mean one thing. It could mean another. Context is critical in the if you look at the word work. And of course, the obvious two scriptures to start with when you talk about work is there's two sides to this issue between grace and law. Uh, we'll start it that way. You're not saved by the works of the law. You know, we're saved not of works, lest any man should boast. And yet, faith without works is dead. And we are His workmanship created uh, in Christ Jesus unto good works. <laughs> as, we, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all men. Especially prioritizing the house of faith. Prioritize your brothers where you can. But that doesn't mean you have to limit your goodness to your brothers. Is not God good to all? Does He not reign on the just and the unjust? You see, there's lots of opportunities to help people who aren't saved. And if you have the opportunity, do it. Be, be uh, you know, when the Bible talks about perfection, be perfect, even, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. It's not a, that, that statement, Jesus did not make that statement in context of your personal conduct. Uh, or whether you, well, I mean, your personal morality or anything, although that is important. I'm not dismissing that. But the context of be ye perfect is right after he said, "If uh, love your enemies, do good to them that persecute you, despitefully use you, and be perfect. Well, per- perfection has to do with when you're, you're good to the unthankful and the ungodly and the persecutor and the guy who's slandering you, you're good to them. That's when you're perfect. If you salute your brethren, so what? The heathen do that? <laughs> what, what, how are you any different than the heathen? But, now, you see where I'm going with this. Well, there's a distinction between, I'll say it again, handwriting of ordinances and the Ten Commandments. But the, like, again, it gets comprehensive. So works, not of works, lest any man should boast. Well, does that mean there's no works we have to do in the flesh? It means we're not required to do any works of righteousness because we're not saved by works. But the Bible says, yet yeah, you are saved by works. Your response in the flesh to faith. So there's a work of faith and there's a work of the flesh. And both of them are actions and deeds that come out of your body. And because people see Colossians and they say, uh, and the Torah people misunderstand me, uh, I think on this, or, or or I need to be more clear about it, or they need to hear me talk about it more. But uh, you know, because I say the handwriting of ordinances was nailed to the cross; it was unprofitable. The handwriting of ordinances, God took it out of the way. It was contrary to us. It couldn't. It got us all. And why? Because it, the handwriting of ordinances got us all. Got the Old Testament people or would get you all involved in obeying a bunch of rules and rituals and things, and uh, that are. Ordinances, commandments, things imposed upon you. Fundamentally, 
fundamentally, the law fails to bring perfection. It fails to save you and it fails to bring forth righteousness. The law can't save you. Not even, The Ten Commandments can't save you. The, law, the ordinances of Moses can't save you. Okay? Moses said, to told us to do this. Moses told us to get circumcised. Moses told us we could write a bill of divorce. Moses told us that's all handwriting of ordinances. You notice whenever Jesus and the Pharisees are, when, when, when Jesus is challenged on any of those issues, they're always talking about the handwriting of ordinances. And Jesus always, and I'll read some scriptures, Jesus says, is it not written in your law? And I'm telling you, Jesus made a distinction. He said, that's your law. I'm not under the law of ordinances of Moses' handwriting. Anywhere through the Torah. Okay, does that mean that we dismiss all purity and holiness and we ignore everything the Torah says? No, we, the Torah is good. You, you, you can read the Torah and you can extract from it uh, how it foreshadows Christ, how it describes the righteous nature, the divine nature. You can reference the Torah to uh, strengthen your case for holiness and purity. You can go back to the Torah. And I find it ironic that they think I'm doing away with the Torah. And I'm not really doing away with it, but you're going to find out that what, what God is doing away with is all the ritual things. Mm-hmm. All the rules and the do's and the don'ts. The, like I said before. Anyway, rightfully dividing the word of truth is uh, study to show thyself a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And part of rightly dividing the word of truth is God showing people uh, and, and ministers and even Christians themselves coming to an understanding that, okay, when the Bible says law in this scripture, here's what it's referring to. Now, when the Bible says law in that scripture, here's what it's referring to. And it can be referring to slightly different things, different contexts. Okay, let's just look basically at the definition of law. I could say a law is a rule. You must wear your seatbelt. You must drive 55 miles an hour on the highway. Right? Those are laws. Those are rules. That's one definition of law. Another definition of law could mean a description of a natural process that does not change. And I've talked about this before. Science talks about the law of the conservation of energy. The law of the conservation of energy. It just seems the law of the conservation of energy is is simply man's way of scientifically observing what God framed in nature by His Word. And they say, well, you know, we we've noticed that energy is not created and it's not destroyed. It just it's uh, uh, it, energy is used in the process and then it changes form. So. I mean, does not not agree with the principle of creation? Is God, is not God the the source of all life or all, if you want to say it scientifically, the source of all energy and power? It's God. God is the source of all energy and power. And He's not created and He's not destroyed. What's happening? He's just changing the form of things. A process happens and it changes form and uh, he's getting a certain result that he wants out of it. Mm-hmm. Your spirit that God gives you, the spirit of life, when you die, it goes back to God who gave it. He's not losing anything in his spirit there. But, uh, so there you go. So a law can be a, the law of the conservation of energy. Is, energy is not created or destroyed. It's just... Uh, changes form, and of course some of that energy is consumed or used up in the process, and then that's called the law of entropy. The energy is used up until there's no more energy left for that process. Now that energy still exists somewhere else. Well, that's that's the way. So that's, that's not a rule. That is not a thou shalt not. That's not something that dictates to you a conduct or code of behavior that you must adhere by. Now, let's get into something else fundamental that I've always point out about the law. The law can make nothing perfect. Fundamentally, fundamentally, what's, what, why, why is the law against the righteousness of God? Because the righteousness of God 
is what God wants. He's after worship. He wants a submitted will. He wants you in agreement with Him. And then as you agree with Him, you yield to His divine nature. And that's what produces the righteousness, is the consent of the will, the willingness. In order for there to be worship, there has to be a will. In order for there to be worship and will, you have to have an option. You have to have an option where you can say, well, yeah, I, okay, I will consent to God's will or I will not consent to God's will. If you don't have the option, then there is no platform for worship. Wor- worship is my own volition. I, I exercise a willing decision to show my preference or my love for God. Something that comes from within me. And this is not the essence of uh, what God's after shall come to pass. I'll write my laws in their minds and in their hearts and I will dwell in them. And it will be God working in you to produce the righteousness. It's not that the righteousness of the law is no longer required or anything. It's not that the morality and the virtue and the purity and the holiness that the Torah may describe is, is no longer valid. All that's still valid. It's just how do we accomplish it? I, and the problem with the law is that law is thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, for the most part. Well, does that give you an option? No, no the law just says thou shalt not. doesn't matter whether you want to or don't want to. doesn't matter whether you agree or disagree. The law says thou shalt not. There's no option, so there's no worship of God. Does that mean, oh, well, then I will go out and steal, then I'll, then I'll just go out and do this and that, or lie, cheat, commit adultery? No. The righteousness of the law has to still be fulfilled. It still has to be fulfilled in us, but not as a result of a legalistic um, uh, requirement or a rule or an ordinance imposed upon you which is completely impersonal and has nothing to do with your own choice or volition because right. there's no worship in that and you can go on and on then why did uh, God even give the law well because perfection hadn't come Christ hadn't come and it wasn't the fullness of time for Christ to come so the law was given because trans- uh, was transgressions were increasing and they were kept under the law as a guideline, a system, a deterrence to the proliferation of evil until Christ would come and God knew eventually He was going to just do away with that covenant and bring in a new one. It was like an interim measure. Now, so you go back to Torah, does it mean the Torah is is not valid? We never look at it, we never consider it, we never never try to practice the uh, purity or the holiness or the morality uh, of when, whenever the Torah does speak of morality and conduct, are we not supposed to do those things? Of course we are. We're supposed to do those things. But we have to also do them from the divine nature. We have to do them out of a sense of loving God, not because it's a requirement, a legal requirement, that thereby defeating the whole um, essence of worship. Okay, now we're going to get into some things here. Oh, for instance, this is what I find irony, uh, ironic. I went to a meeting of people who were very Torah-oriented. They focus on Torah. They use all the Hebrew pronunciations. They observe all the feast days and, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, some of them may have issue with me because they think I'm trying to do away with the Torah. And I said, I'm not really trying to do away with the Torah. And the uh, irony is, is that what the meeting that I went to, that that they, uh, their their meeting that I went to, the entire meeting was conducted by women. Mm-hmm. And uh, of course, that's very much against God's will, and very much against God's scripture. Yeah. Okay. Now I, we can get into this all all you want, and about women in the church and speaking and all of that. I do believe if a woman is purely in the Spirit of God, operating in a gift or something, then I believe at that moment that she wants to prophesy, speak in tongues and interpretation, I I think a woman can do that. Because at that moment, at that moment, captured by the anointing, there's no male or female. She's doing it under authority or in the structure of the church. The Bible says, don't suffer the woman to teach or usurp authority over the man. And also he says in Corinthians that, you know, let not the woman speak in the church 
And if they have any questions, let them ask their husbands at home. And I believe, now I've got to have to look more into this, but this is, the context of that is more like uh, the preacher is preaching and the women are blurting out questions. Well, why? Well, then what about this? Or what about that? They don't understand something and they start blurting out questions in the middle of the church. Well, that's not in order. Right. And I would say nobody should do that, not even the men. But anyway, the women were doing that and... and no, but, but certainly, women are not in the place of authority. Right. They're not in leadership roles. That's what Paul said. What? Did the word of God come out from you, woman? It, it come from the man. Mm-hmm. Just like uh, as, in, everything in, in, in nature is an allegory of the spiritual. The seed is the word of God. Well, when you produce life in the natural, where does the seed come from? The woman or the man? Mm-hmm. It comes from the man. So the, the pattern holds true then. So what I'm saying is uh, a woman can, there's a certain context I believe a woman could say something in the church in the spirit, but certainly not leading service, taking charge, or anything like that. Right? So let your women be in subjection and let them keep silence as also saith the law. <laughs> you see? And then the other thing you're going to have to think about concerning law, and this, this idea goes to the Ten Commandments and to the law of Moses. Well, if you're going to live by law and rule and Torah, or if, even if you're going to live by just Ten Commandments without a relationship with God, without producing the righteousness of God in you by the Holy Ghost, so that you do what's right by nature, not by a conscious deliberation of something outside compelling you to do it, if you can't do it from within, willingly, because you understand and you know God and you love God, if you love me, keep my commandments, Amen. the law of Christ. If you can't do it from the divine nature, then it has no value. As also saith the law, they, Paul says that, as also saith the law, the law has a value to it. The Torah still has a value to it. I will consent to that. Um, but now let's get into this a little bit more about the difference between. So there's a difference between... I'm making the distinction between Ten Commandments and and Torah. But the Ten Commandments, like, like, okay, here's what I was getting at. If, if you, like, I think it's in James, it says, uh, if you try to live by the law and you're guilty in one point, you're guilty of the whole thing, right? Mm-hmm. For he that says, do not steal, also said, do not covet. Yeah. Amen. Now, but if you don't steal, but you covet... Uh, I, I, because you only broke one of the Ten Commandments, uh, you should be able to get like nine-tenths into the kingdom then, right? Because you only not, you, you made nine out of ten? No. You break one, you're guilty of them all. The essence of this is any potential to commit iniquity, any potential, even not, even not manifested yet, just the potential, means that if you carry that into eternity, somewhere in eternity, the potential will manifest. Just give it enough time. So that's why Jesus says, oh, you heard him say of old time, you know, eye for an eye and a tooth for an eye. But now I say. Amen. He says, it's, it's, a, it's a different way now. It's a different covenant. Mm-hmm. We're not going to do this by obeying ordinances and rules and rituals. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to make another distinction. I'm going to say the things of purity and righteousness, righteous conduct, righteous character, things that manifest the righteousness of God in us. You know, morality, virtue, purity, charity, faith. If the Torah has anything that can shed light on those subjects, then the Torah is valid. We can refer back to it, like Paul did, as also saith the law. If I can use the law to strengthen my, uh, my pitch for the righteousness of God in your flesh, then I will use the law to support what I'm saying. But I'm not, righteousness isn't coming by the law. But the law, the righteousness that the law is trying to describe, which is divine nature. Now, I'm going to make another distinction. Yeah, so I'm making a distinction between ritualistic things like feast days, tithes, circumcision, and rules like divorce and, and all that kind of stuff, which was written in the handwriting of ordinances which don't particularly speak to 
the purity of the divine nature that is to be manifested in us. They're more like rituals and things. Those are the things that got nailed to the cross. Clearly in Colossians. Therefore, let no man judge you in meat or drink or respect of a holy day or the new moon or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. And there's details to point out in there that I'm, I'm, I may not get to yet. But now, if the Torah says anything concerning uh, covetousness or adultery or purity or honesty or... Uh, Humility, or any of the virtues and characters of, of godly people, and the Torah makes reference or alludes to it somehow, then I'll take the Torah and say, as also saith the Torah, or the law, or Moses. But like I said, both the Ten Commandments or the Torah, or the handwriting of ordinances, if you're going to say you're living by it, then you got to keep the whole thing. If the Torah is valid and we're supposed to live in it, well, darn, let's build the tabernacle. Let's get the Levites out here. Let's make an altar. Let's get our animal sacrifices going. Yeah. See, those are the things that are nailed to the cross. Those are the things. Yeah, absolutely. Not the purity and the holiness yeah. and the right conduct. and the, They're still valid. And you can use the Torah or the Ten Commandments to validate those things as you preach them to God's people, as Paul did. So, yeah, so not one jot or tittle will pass from the law until all is fulfilled. So the law is still valid. But most, of, most if not all the time, I haven't vetted this completely out, but Jesus talking about law, when he talks about law or commandment of God, he's always referring to the Ten Commandments and as far as handwriting of ordinances and ties and circumcision and all that stuff, he always says to the Pharisees, your law is not written in your law. It's not written in your law. He said, That's not my law. That's not the law that I'm going to use to bring forth righteousness. <laughs> so now, the Bible says that we're no longer under the law, so to speak. Handwriting of ordinances. We're not under rules and regulations to bring forth righteousness, but we're not without law unto God. Amen. It doesn't mean we're lawless. No we still have a law. Absolutely. We're under a law. The law of God. Amen. The law of Christ. Amen. The law of liberty. Absolutely. The law of charity. Praise God. The law of liberty. Amen. What's the law of liberty? The law of liberty is, is, in a nutshell, it's like this. Don't live by rules and regulations, but try to do what's right and moral. Have a consciousness of trying to please God. And know that those Ten Commandments are describing the righteousness of the divine nature. And you do what you can, and what you, you walk in liberty. And when you walk in liberty, just know for a certainty that if you walk in the sight of your eyes or... In, in the counsel that you have up to this time in your own conscience, but you're trying to uh, please God, and you're then that know that God is going to bring all of this into judgment. And if your perception of what you think God wanted you to do is not what God wanted you to do, then what are you going to learn obedience by? You're going to learn obedience by the things you suffer when you did those things that God didn't really want you to do, but you thought for sure that was uh, He'd be pleased with it. And so what's the law of liberty? The law of liberty is I'm at liberty to feel this stuff out and try this and try that. Now, just when you do that, make sure you're in the fear of God. Amen. Just that don't do it nonchalant and haphazard. Amen. Know that, okay, I'm going to do this. And Now, if it's uh, wrong, God's going to bring me into judgment. But I, a law of liberty also acknowledges that there's grace on me. You know, If I don't do it perfectly, God's not going to strike me dead. If I pick up sticks on the Sabbath day, I'm not going to be stoned to death. right? Or if I commit adultery, I'm not going to be stoned to death like the Old Testament. Which, by the way, you want to live by Torah? Well, then let's bring all the covetous people and whatever and let's bring them forth and stone them. You know what I'm saying. Well, well where do you, you know, what are we doing here with, with Torah and law and all this stuff? It needs to be talked about and understood. But I'm telling you, anything that's a ritual type of thing that Moses wrote in handwriting of ordinances. Okay, let's let's go here. Let's let's define it. And I've preached it before. 
The Pharisees come to Jesus tempting him and saying, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Okay, this is the divorce issue. Is divorce addressed in the Ten Commandments? No, not specifically. And he answered and said unto them, have you not read? He which made them at the beginning. So what's Jesus doing now? He's saying, hey, you guys are in law, but I'm Jesus. Amen. Law came by Moses. I'm here, I'm grace and truth. And before Moses came, and before, before the fall, God had things set up from the beginning. But anyway, he says, Have you not read, He which made them at the beginning made him male and female? For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more two, twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. They said unto him, Well, then why did Moses command to give a writing of divorcement? And put her away. You see, now this is what I'm about telling you. People who have an inordinate affection with the, with the Torah, yeah. they're doing so at the expense of Jesus. Yes. See, what were the Pharisees? But Moses said, but Moses said, but Moses said. Yeah, well, what did Jesus say? Amen. Flame with fire. What did Jesus say? you got to understand that there's two covenants. Yes. The, the first covenant was not profitable to, to bring forth perfection. So God put it away. That first covenant. Yes. Christ is become the end of the law for righteousness. Until all that believe. It's not the end of the law. No. It's still a good reference point. Yes. Mm -hmm. As also saith the law. It's a good reference point for many points of liberty and righteousness and holiness and purity. And as I say... But it's the end of using that law right. to impress God or, or say I'm righteous before God. Right. It's the end of the law for righteousness. It's not the end of the law because the law is good if a man uses it lawfully for its purpose. If Christ doesn't come forth and people start sinning, uh, transgressions increase, you add the law until those people can come forth in the perfection of Christ in them. This, and we can go on and on about that too. Law is not for a righteous man, but for whoremongers and men stealers and perjurers and anything contrary to sound doctrine. So the Pharisees are always referencing Moses at the expense of Jesus. You see that? Well, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wife. So from the beginning, it was not so. And then, uh, you know, the controversy that they had with uh, Jesus concerning the man who died having no children and his brother was to raise up seed and he died having no children and the next brother and the next brother and so on. He said, Master, Moses says, if a man dies having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother and so on and so on. So, you see, what I'm establishing here scripturally is that the Pharisees were always Moses said, Moses said, Moses said. Okay? Mark twelve nineteen, Master, Moses wrote unto us if a man's brother died. Now, now when Jesus is confronting the Pharisees about their legalistic rules and things, what does he say? Then came, the Je then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do the tri disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? They wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God? Not Moses. Why do you transgress the commandment of God? Now, what's he going to take, what's he going to refer to here? Is he going to refer to anything in the Torah or the handwriting of Moses? No, he's going to go right back to the tables of stone. You watch. He goes right back to the tables of stone. That's why you've got to make a distinction between the tables of stone and the handwriting of ordinances. If you're going to understand this issue at all. God commanded saying, honor your father and mother. And that's one of the Ten Commandments. Right. Now let me backtrack a bit. Some of the Ten Commandments are proactive. Yeah. Honor your father and mother. Yeah. Love the Lord your God. Yeah. Right? So they are not the thou shalt nots. No. And these are the... <laughs> see how he's emphasizing that. Because those are the proactive ones, the ones that involve your, your will, sure. willingly. Yeah, love the Lord. Yeah. Honor your father and mother. Yeah. For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and mother. He that curseth the father and mother, let him die to death. But you say, Whosoever shall say to his father and mother, It is a gift, 
by whatsoever thou mayest be profited by me, and then honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. So what happens when you focus on Moses at the expense of Jesus? You make the commandment of God of none effect. You're, I've saying it before, you're producing another image. Over and over indulgence and over emphasis on Torah at the expense of God produces another image. Yeah. It's not the image of Christ. Yeah. For the law, having a shadow of things to come, but not the very image. Christianity is about the very image of God yeah. in our Praise mortal God. bodies. Praise the God. very image. Praise the Lord. Not obeying a rule. Amen. And if you come short of that, you missed it. Well, I like this. You know, it is Corban. Another place says, uh, what, uh, "It is a gift, but whatsoever thou mayest be profited by me." Now you're no longer. You, now you no longer have to honor your father and mother because you gave the gift. Sounds like Mother's Day to me. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, here, Ma, we'll send you some roses on Mother's Day. Ah, oh, love you, Ma. No, no, no. And then the other 364 days of the year, oh, sorry, I was just too busy yeah. at work. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, no longer subject to honor father and mother oh. because I gave the gift. Oh, yeah. You know, a false appeasing of the conscience, thinking you fulfilled some kind of spiritual issue that's supposed to be a charity thing. Well, that's like the that's like the Catholics going to Christmas uh, Mass and Easter Mass, and the another 364 days, the yep. three days of the year, they never they never practice any kind of yep. religion. Gospel. Another gospel. I have your token one meeting a year, two meetings a year, huh. and then forsake the communion of the saints the rest of the year. Yeah. There you go. Mm-hmm. I'd say, lo, I fulfilled the commandment of God. We had our yearly meeting. No. There's something wrong there. Well, you hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, seeing this, saying, this people draw nigh with their mouth, honor me with their lips, their heart is far from me. In vain did they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Now, you feel well, reject the man, commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. For God commanded. Now, Let's go to uh, no, Exodus 32. And I was talking about the golden calf there last week from Exodus 32, but it also has some important scriptures in there in that section of that area of the scripture. Let me read it, okay? And here's why I'm making the distinction. Now, let, we're focusing on the Ten Commandments here now for the next little while. The Ten Commandments and the Table of Stone are very significant because Paul goes on in Corinthians who says, God who... That whole episode of the Tables of Stone was a dramatic episode, and it was that was the administration of death. If that was glorious, how much more glorious for us. And uh, God is writing in the fleshly tables of our hearts. He's writing His laws through our experiences and through what we suffer when we break the commandments or we do things contrary and we receive and reap and... And then while we're receiving and while we're reaping, hopefully if we're Christians, we have the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost is pricking and ministering to us as we reap and instructing our hearts. And we're, we're seeing the why, why it is a necessity to, to pursue godliness and all that kind of stuff. Now, just remember, there's a handwriting of ordinances and there's a writing of God. And I'm making the distinction. Exodus 32. Verse 15, Moses turned, went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony, those are two tables of stone with the Ten Commandments, two tables of testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other, they were written. And the tables were the work of God. And the writing was the writing of God. And the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. Now, what did God write with? And I don't think it's here, and I'm just kind of winging it here too, but God wrote it with a fiery finger. It was a fiery finger of God engraving 
onto the tables of stone. Because Paul took that whole episode as an allegory for God taking the Holy Spirit and burning those laws and writing them on the tables of our heart. And how is he doing it? Is he doing it with his hand? No, he's doing it with his finger. finger. He's doing it by the Holy Ghost. Remember Jesus? If I, by the finger of God, cast out devils, because they said, oh, by the power of Beelzebub, he cast out devils. He says, no, I do it with the power of the finger of God, which is obviously is the Holy Ghost. The tables of stone were written with the finger of God. I'll say this somewhere in the scriptures. I don't remember where. Not in Exodus 32, it looks like. So it's the work of God. It's the writing of God. It's the finger of God. I'm making a distinction. It wasn't Moses. It was God. Yes. It wasn't the handwriting. It was a fiery finger. finger. Now, in Romans chapter 7, it's talking about the law. And it's talking about tables of stone here. When Paul is in Romans 7. For I had not known lust except the law said, Thou shalt not covet. So he's talking about the tables of stone. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Now that's pretty clear alluding to the tables of stone, right? The Ten Commandments. But sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died, and the commandment which is ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law, now remember, when we're saying law here, in context of Romans 7, we're focusing on the Ten Commandments. That's his context. For the law is holy, and the commandment, holy and just and good. Those Ten Commandments are holy. They're just. They're good. They describe the divine nature. It's like I said, if, if Christ is operating in you, which one of the Ten Commandments does He break? Which one? Nothing. He doesn't. He fulfills it. The righteousness that that describes is being fulfilled. Acted out. You are not coveting. You are not bearing false witness. You are not committing adultery. You are honoring your father and mother. You are loving the Lord your God. You're doing them. Not as a deliberation of conscience because something, somebody out there told you this is the rule that you have to obey. Nevertheless, it's to be fulfilled. And we'll get to that. Just hang on to that idea. Because Jesus says it as well. Okay, the law is holy. The commandment holy and just and good. That's not talking about Torah, handwriting of ordinances. Although those things were good for what God used them for. I'm not saying they're invalid or anything, but here Paul is talking about the Ten Commandments. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is good, but the law is, this is the key word here, for we know that the law is spiritual. Was the, uh, was the handwriting of Moses spiritual? We'll, we'll see, if I get to it, we'll see in Ephesians, Colossians, and Hebrews, the handwriting of Moses. The system of animal sacrifices, the feast days, the dietary laws, and all that stuff. It was a system of carnal, carnal ordinances. Carnal ordinances imposed upon them until the time of Reformation. Jesus was the time of Reformation. It became... Time to end the carnal ordinances. Yes. It was a change of the covenant. It was a change of the priesthood. It was a change in the entire approach by which we attain righteousness. Amen. Not by Torah. Right. Not even by a conscious, deliberate, self-willed keeping of the Ten Commandments. God. The law is spiritual. Why? Because look at the Ten Commandments. What wrote the table? What wrote the commandments on the table of stone? Did Moses go up there with his pen and no. scratch it into the tables of stone? Finger of God, Finger of God. Spirit of God. Amen. Therefore, it's spiritual. Praise the Lord. Right. Moses' handwriting was carnal. Yep. Ten commandments was spiritual. Amen. See the distinction? Amen. 
You'll see in the New Testament, every time Jesus talks about keeping the law, and da, 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 he's always going to point back to the Ten Commandments. Always. And when he talks about handwriting of ordinances and all that, the animal sacrifices and all rules and regulations, he always says, your law. Yeah. All right, so the law is spiritual. Now, if the law is spiritual, then why can't I just decide to keep it and be spiritual? Well, this is the thing. I can't just decide to keep the law under my own will and power. Then I get the delusion of thinking it's my power that keeps the law. And now it's not God's power, is it? It's my power. If I think anything's of my own power, I get the impression that I'm my own entity and my sufficiency is of myself. I don't have to be joined to anything because I have power, right? I don't need this. I don't need that. I don't need you. I don't need God. I don't need anything. Eventually, that's what it what it's going to fall out onto. So God made it like this on purpose, so you couldn't do it just by self-will. Right. Did, could, could, can you? You can't. So if the law is, is spiritual, why can't I just keep it and be spiritual? Is that the law's fault? It's not the law's fault. Law is spiritual. Well, how come I can't be spiritual by keeping it? Because I am carnal. Yeah. Carnal man can't keep a spiritual law. No. That's why you have to be born again. You yeah, can only totally. do it by the yeah. Spirit. The hand of God. Glory. Has to be the hand of God in all things. God has. That which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do not. What I hate, that I do. And he's yeah. talking about this conflict he's going through in my mind, in the spirit of my mind. I know what's good, and I would like to do what's right for God. And when I try to do it, I end up doing evil. The evil that I don't want to do, I do. The good that I want to do, I don't do. So what does that mean? I'm under some kind of sure. deception and power. Sure. I'm in a bondage to something making me do the thing I don't want to do. How do you fool them today? So what does that do? Well, that make, makes me subject to hope in God to deliver me. Yeah. That means I can't do this myself. That's I can only do it with God. With, with God's. Absolutely. Now that's where God wants you to be. That's, that's what right. He wants you to learn. Yes. Amen. All right. So anyway, you get the idea. So it's not the handwriting of ordinances. Work was the work of God. John 7, starting verse 19, Jesus says, Did not Moses give you the law? What law are you suppose he's talking about there? Law of ordinances. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did not Moses give you the law? None of you keep the law. Why go about to kill me? People said, Thou is a devil who goeth about to kill thee. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, I have done one work and you all marvel. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it's of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry at me because I have made a man every whip whole on the Sabbath day? Then they, uh, John 8, they, they catch the woman, caught, catch her in the very act in adultery. Moses said, stone her, but what sayest thou? Well, come on, you're Pharisees. If you're living by Moses' law, why why you have to ask the question? Just go stone her, kill her. <laughs> right. Pharisee, you know. Now let's get into the scriptures of uh I'm gonna go into the Ephesians and Colossians scriptures. And I don't know if I can pick up the scriptures in Hebrews or not. I, I did make the point though. Um see Ten Commandments, Exodus twenty. Just to emphasize my point again. And Moses wrote all these words saying, is that what Exodus 20 says? Exodus 20 says, and God spake. Yeah, yeah. God spake all these words saying, thou shalt have no other gods before me, and thou shalt not covet. Right, right. And then the fiery finger would etch it on the table as a stone. Right. So it's actually a dual thing. He said it, and then he etched it into the stone right. with his spirit. Deuteronomy 4, 12 to 14, The Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the voice of the words, but saw no similitude, only you heard a voice. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even ten commandments. And he wrote them on two tables of stone. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that you might do them in the land. Well, that, there's the handwriting of ordinance, statutes and judgments. If your brother have an ass in the ditch, thou shalt surely recover thy brother's ass and, you know, whatever. Well, those, those things in the Torah are good. Wouldn't you want your, ass, your brother to recover your ass if you, your ass fell in the ditch? 
Well, those parts of the Torah, they're, they're still valid. They're still okay. Why? Because they're describing the righteousness of what charity would do. Yeah. Right. Right? Sure. So I can still use the Torah to emphasize those good things. Right. That's why it's still valid. It's still there. Yeah. Ephesians 2. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus under good works. So I thought we're not saved by works. You see what I'm saying, right? You have to divide. Yeah, sure. when, when, when they're saying law, all throughout the Bible they're saying the law. Thus, uh, the, for the law says, for the law says, for the law of this, the law of that. What What are you talking about? Sometimes they're talking Ten Commandments. Sometimes right. they're talking handwriting of ordinances. Sometimes they're just talking about a, a spiritual process. Right. The law of God, the law of Christ, the law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul. Yeah. Well, what law of the Lord is that? Is that a law of rules that someone's telling you? No. Uh, commandments to keep or ordinances? No, no the, that law of the Lord is describing a motion, a spiritual process, mm-hmm. an operation that we go through, which involves preaching, fellowship, communion, experiences, Amen. successes, failures, tribulation, uh, affliction, fire, Amen. judgment, grace, mercy, Amen. forgiveness. All this, all these ingredients in, in the big process that you go through, which is the law of the Lord, yes. right? It's like I said before, the law of physics, the law of the conservation of energy. It's not a rule. It's simply something describing a, an unchangeable process, something that turns out the same each time. It's a patterned process. Anybody made subject to it has the same outcome. Anybody who gets saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, and goes through the affliction of God and re- maintains their humility and, and gets transformed by the renewing of their mind and goes through all these... Uh, anybody who goes through all of that comes out as a son of God at the end. Right? It's the law of the Lord. Anybody who takes two egg, uh, eggs and puts them in and beats them up with a little milk and throws in some flour and then sugar and blah, 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 puts it in the oven, it always comes out as a loaf of bread or a Nice cake. It's the law of the law of the kitchen of the godly housewife. I don't know what would you call it. Whenever you go through that process, you always get the same result, right? It's almost like a recipe. It's almost like God's recipe to bring a son of God to pass. So we're created unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Okay, now here, here, here we go. Now we're dividing. So there's a good work which we come up with. We, we uh, conceive it in our imagination and we think, oh, well, this will impress God or, or this will make me feel like I'm a, a good person and I'm a value to society. So I think I will do this and I will do that. And, and we come up with the work. We conceive it. We take, maybe have the potential to take credit for it. Well, those are the works we're not saved by. You're not saved by works. And what's the context? Lest any man should boast. But now these are works, but we still have to do good works. <laughs> we still have to do good works. But works that God sets up. God ordains. Right. He shows us the work, and we walk in it. We fulfill it. Absolutely. And I often, uh, uh, over and over again, I've used Acts chapter 10 as an example of that, how Peter preached to the Gentiles. He did not deliberate, oh, I think I'll go see if the Gentiles will receive the Lord now. No, he was just praying, and he didn't even know what was going on. God was setting up the whole thing. I won't go into it, but you, you, most of you here should remember. So, remember, wherefore, remember, you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the, in the flesh, made by hands, or the natural Jew, that at that time you were without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, no hope, and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ, for He is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. Abolished in his flesh the enmity. What is the enmity? The law of commandments contained in ordinances. Praise the Lord. Carnal ordinances. Yes. For to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Why is it why was it the enmity? Because it got you distracted in a bunch of do's and don'ts and animal sacrifices and ritualistic things that don't bring you into relationship with God that never produce righteousness coming from deep from within your own heart. You're distracted in the other exercise. 
You get too focused in on Torah and rules and regulations. You get too focused on it. It's at the expense of fulfilling the law of Christ. It's not that the Torah is completely invalid or not of value. Not at all. It's not that it's completely done away with. It's not, it's not completely done away with. It has a value. It has a use. There are things in the Torah that describe the righteousness of God as well as the Ten Commandments. So he abolished in his flesh the enmity, the law of commandments contained in ordinances to make in, in himself a twain one new man, so making peace. That they might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Colossians makes also a reference to this. And you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. He's talking about the circumcision of the heart. You know, the old man, the old flesh man, the old worldly man gets cut away. All his ambitions and desires and pursuits slowly get cut out of your heart. Circumcision without hands, for and Paul says we're not a Jew. He is not a Jew outwardly, neither is that circumcision the circumcision of the flesh, but he is a Jew inwardly, and that circumcision is the circumcision of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter. When I watch these some people when Jesus goes around and says, If you love me, keep my commandments, and every time Jesus says his commandments, I know there's people who try to substitute keep my Torah. And that is wrong. Totally. In mass, His, his Jesus' commandment is love one another. Yeah. And so doing, you will fulfill. But but don't point to the, the Torah in the system of ordinances. Because you're getting you're gonna have righteousness come forth the wrong way. It's not even gonna be right the true righteousness of God. So you're you're uh circumcision made without hands and putting off the bodies of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him with baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Now, Ephesians called it the enmity, slaying the enmity. Even the commandments and ordinances. And I added the word carnal there, but not, I'm not adding to the word here. Because if you want to confirm that he's talking about carnal ordinances, I'll try to get that for you in the book of Hebrews. But anyway, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or in respect of a holy day or new moon or of the Sabbath days which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is Christ. So there's your context. Handwriting of ordinances. What did that have to do? Meats and drinks and dietary rules and respect of holy days. You, you can't have any charge. If somebody doesn't keep the feast days, you, don't, you have no charge against them. And I don't, have, I don't have a charge if you keep them as long as you don't obsess over them and you defeat the law of Christ by your, by your overzealous and your inordinate affection with legalism and law and Torah. If you're doing it at the expense of Christ, I have an issue with it. But for someone just to say, well, it's the Feast of Trumpets, let's have a Feast of Trumpets service and uh, you don't have to go around and blow trumpets. The Feast of Tabernacles, you don't have to go out and set up tents. But if you want to say, this is a special day, it's the Feast of Trumpets, let's talk about trumpets, let's talk about, it's a shadow of things to come, when the trumpet shall sound and Christ shall descend from heaven, let's talk about the significance of the feast days and how they're a shadow of Christ. I don't have any problem. I don't think you should judge someone who decides to say that one day is special to them, let's have a special feast day service. Don't, don't judge them. I think that's exactly what Paul was talking about. One man esteems one day special. One day esteems every man alike, and just be fully persuaded. And the guy who doesn't doesn't the guy who says every day is alike. You know, well, to the Lord, he's he's like that. And the other one, to the Lord, they're esteeming the day. But don't make it a requirement. Don't make it dogmatic. Don't make it a rule. Don't make it a doctrine. 
don't don't make it as something to be imposed upon Christians from without. You just defeated the law of liberty. Okay, let no man judge you in meat or drink in respect of a holy day, new moon or Sabbath days. There's no reference there to uh, righteousness, morality, virtue, holiness, purity. So he's, he's, that's that's not what got nailed to the cross. The the purity of the divine nature didn't get nailed to the cross, did it? So, so these things are a shadow of things to come, but the body is Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility, worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head. From which all the body by joints and bands, having nourishment ministered and knit together, increases with the increase of God. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances and rules and regulations? Touch not, taste not, don't eat that, don't do this, don't do that. Why are you subject to that? Which are all the perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. Can you see the context here? So we can't live by rules. Even if the rule is, says something that seems to be good. I was saying last week, I, I, can even, I can even judge, I know what your conduct ought to be. But if I press your reform, if I press you as a personal issue for you to reform and change your ways, if I do it before the time, before the time ordained of God for your change to come, and I press you and I force you to try to do something, and you do it because you're afraid of me getting on your case all the time. Well, is that the purity of repentance that God's after? No. I, I could even be right. No. My judgment could be right. You should be doing this or should be doing that. Absolutely. It doesn't always work like that, but sometimes that's what happens, right? That's why the Bible says that the overseers are not lords over God's heritage. They are overseers right. of the flock. They understand God's operating on all of these saints and He's working in their hearts. And sure. I have to kind of facilitate and strengthen conviction and maintain godly fear and get the renewing of their minds Amen. and keep that going as they come to themselves Amen. before God, Amen. as God brings them through an operation. Amen. And i got to be careful. I don't get my little mitts interfering with that operation of God. Yeah, I just can't stand by and let evil come to pass and not say anything about it either. Well, so there you go. That's the Colossians. Blotting, right? Handwriting of ordinances. Handwriting. That's Moses' handwriting. Like I say, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about Ties. Now, the Bible says ties, even Jesus says ties was of the fathers. Ties came before the law. But ties ended up in the law, and ties ended up in the handwriting of ordinances, which got nailed to the cross. And I challenge you once again, I challenge you, anybody, show me where it teaches ties in the uh, New Testament. The only reference I see is uh, when Jesus, before the change of covenant, says to the scribes and the Pharisees, you, these that you ought to have done, you ought to have paid your tithes, but you also have omitted the weight of your matters, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you have done, not to leave the others undone. Because right. they were subject to that early former covenant. Right. If you lived in the Old Testament, you were subject to tithes. You were subject to animal sacrifices. You were subject to those things. Let every, it, 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 tithes does not jive with the law of liberty. I said it before, if anybody wants to start off uh, and say, well, I decree within myself I will give 10% of whatever you decide to give, then I, I generally I, I wouldn't knock it. I wouldn't find fault with it. But the, the high mark here and what we should portray and teach is like, like Paul said, let every man give not of necessity. See, it goes against the very principle I'm talking about. When righteousness has to come from a standard or a rule of conduct imposed from you without, from without, then you've taken away the opportunity for the, the person to make a choice of worship. It's no longer liberty. It's now a commandment. Of course, we know what Jesus said, right? He who does not forsake 10% of his paycheck cannot be my disciple. No? He does not forsake all that he has. So if you want to, if you want to, you know, be a Christian and you're a young Christian and you, 
you haven't had a chance to learn things and you're just new in the law of liberty and, and somewhere you read about tithes and you think, well, God would be pleased if I tithe and you do that sincerely, well, I think God would be pleased with that. And then he would also bring you on to say, now listen, don't stop at 10%. <laughs> Here's really what I'm saying. For God loveth a cheerful giver. Let no man give grudgingly. Let no man give of necessity. Pretty clear. On the simple principles of, of the law of liberty. So, here's what we're saying. Ties, circumcision, divorce, feast days, dietary laws, ordinances, rituals. Now, there are certain rites, if you call it R-I-T-E, rites, rituals, uh, certain symbolic actions of compliance that God puts on us in the New Testament. Did you know that? For instance, uh, water baptism, right? Repent and be baptized. You know, and all the apostles in the book of Acts, they, they always commanded them to be baptized. And what did they do? Why, they took the person and they... Put them, submerge them entirely under the water because it represents buried with him. And then they come up out of the water and it represents being raised in newness of life. And as I said before, do you think a single act of going down into the water and then you come up out of the water, is that it? Are you a perfect creature and you'll never sin again? No, because that is symbolic. It represents a baptism of affliction which kills, drowns out the old man, makes you call out to God, teaches you your sufficiency is of God. God says, okay, now they know they can't do it without me. I can give them my power. I can let them live without sin. And they know it's not them. They know it's me. Uh, and they'll never turn into an act of idolatry. And my glory and my, my glory and uh, power and honor will be preserved eternally. And they'll be preserved eternally because they'll never be emboldened to walk independently from me. So it's representative. And as I said before, well, why does God have us do it? Because whenever you have an act of faith, like I say, this is a covenant. We're, we enter into a covenant with God. I was talking about the seals. Remember the seals of the covenant? The covenant is a contract. We're making a contract with God. God says, if you will follow me, if you'll do this and that, and I will save you, I'll purge you and cleanse you, and, and I'll make you a son and bring you onto perfection and sonship and so you've signed the contract how do we sign the contract we sign it with obedience to baptism that's how we sign it every act of faith is more than just believing faith without works is dead i believe god is going to do this in this covenant for me well how do you know well you comply with a symbolic ritual that god requires so, as I, as I said before, when Abraham entered the covenant, his circumcision was a token in the flesh. There's a fleshly token act or deed of obedience which you must offer to God. A token in the flesh. We have to do it and God has to do it. Our token obedience of the flesh is to submit to the commandment to be water baptized that singular act is not the end of our operation, but it, it is our way of signing ourselves into the covenant. And then what does God do? He seals or signs or stamps His approval by the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And it has a token in the flesh, speaking in tongues. All right, now, so we still have these ritual things, but they are New Testament ones. They're not the Old Testament ones. Now, in the Old Testament, they were subject, they had to do their animal sacrifices. Because that's how God set it up. That's how they demonstrated their, that was their token deed of obedience to say they believed God. And that was just pushing sacrifice, uh, sins forward as the high priest once a year would offer and push the sins ahead another year. And we won't go into all of that, but Hebrews talks about that too. Until Christ came. And he would make the final sacrifice for the sins, not just our sins, but for the sin of the whole world. So you see all those things, ties, circumcision. Uh, here's another thing in Colossians. Let no man 
judge you in meat or drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. Plural. Right. Now the writer, English writers of the New Testament here understood that there is a distinction between the Sabbath days that are mandated uh, in the feast days. The feast days have certain beginning and end days that they call Sabbaths. Those are days within the feast days, which do not necessarily fall on Saturday. Because the feast days start and stop different times each year, according to the moon and and all of those things. So that's why it says Sabbath days, plural. So people make the mistake of saying Colossians 2.16, let no man judge you in meat or drink in respect of a holy day or new moon of the Sabbath days. They make the mistake of saying that means we don't have to keep the Sabbath. No, those are Sabbath days specifically referred to in the observance of the feast days and is not referring to the Sabbath day which God instituted from the beginning. And you, you can see enough reference in the New Testament that observance of the Sabbath day continued into the New Testament. And again, don't get dogmatic about Sabbath day either. Don't get legalistic about Sabbath. Jesus warned, you know, the Sabbath was not made for, uh, man was not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. And so people will say, well, Hebrews says that there remains a rest to the people of God, and that's the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the rest that you have in your heart. And so therefore we don't have to keep the uh, literal Sabbath day because my Sabbath is spiritualized. I have a rest in my heart. Well, it's both. It's both. And so people miss sometimes. No, it's both. Well, the baptism that saves you is the baptism of affliction that you go through. It's the afflictions that save you. Uh, But uh, so does that mean uh, we don't have to get water baptized then? No, you also have to get water baptized. No, the rest we're looking for, the Sabbath, the real spiritual Sabbath we're, we're really trying to get is this peace and rest in our heart. We cease from our own works and just do God's works. We're, we're at rest. There remains a rest. Yes. As Hebrews says, that doesn't mean you stop keeping the uh, other one, the, the physical, literal Sabbath. Remember, God said, I call heaven and earth, heaven and earth to witness this day against you. God wants you to do it in the spirit and in the flesh. He wants it, in the, he wants it both fulfilled. Just to do it spiritually does not disqualify your requirement to do it in the natural. All right, so that's the whole thing about that and Sabbath and everything else. All right, Hebrews 9, 9 and 10. Tabernacle and all of these things. I'm going to better get a better context here. The first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick, the table, the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, and after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer, the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, Ten Commandments, and over it cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly, And when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying the way into the holiest of all, was not yet made manifest, while as yet the first tabernacle was standing, which was a figure for the time present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats, drinks, divers, washing, and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. reformation till Christ comes. Amen. And then Jesus Christ comes. And what was the dispute? Well, Moses said, Moses said, Moses said. And Jesus says, well, you heard, of, you heard Moses say, you heard them say of old time, You've heard them that it said, eye for eye, two for two. You've heard them say of all time, if this happens, they, then kill them with stones. You've heard them, uh, My Lord. but now, yes. I say, now. Yes. now, 
I say. Amen. The old covenant. Amen. Uh, unprofitable. Amen. Did not bring forth Absolutely. righteousness. And God said, we're going to do away with it to bring Praise forth righteousness. Lord. We have a new covenant. Glory, Glory to God. Amen. And if you ignore that, yes. you're going straight back into Judaism, legalism, sure. righteousness by rule, carnal ordinances. And you're going to forsake the law of Christ. You're going to defeat the platform for worship. And you're going to have men of God like Paul crying over you, Oh, I wish you could be saved. You're so zealous about your rules and your laws and your Torahs and you're this and you're that. You have a zeal for God, but you're going about establishing your own righteousness. You're, you're missing the righteousness of Christ. Well, it's carnal. See, carnal ordinances could not make the service, uh, him that did the service perfect. But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Well, I'll say it again. You want to impose rules, regulations, Torahs? Jesus said, keep my commandments. He wasn't talking Torah. He was not talking Torah. Now, I, I just, I, there's something I missed, and I'm just realizing I missed it, so bear with me, and, and I will make that point in a second here. So how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works? Isn't that the first principles of Christ? Repentance from dead works, dead works carnal rules, ordinances, ritualistic things that Moses wrote. All of that. It's not that they're completely without value or merit. If used properly in the proper degree. And if it's used to bring you to the understanding of how it's a shadow of Christ. And bring you into the operation of God. And the law of liberty. And it's not that uh, people who observe such things are not without certain um, noble qualities about them. And that uh, they're zealous, you know. They're serious, they're zealous, and they're diligent, but let's not miss the mark. Like I say, you want to keep the Torah or emphasize it? Keep the whole thing. Keep it all. I, I thought it was very ironic. You want to press Torah on me? And that's, I know Torah people, they let their women run the, run the church. And even their Torah tells them not to do that. Now, I'm, I'm, <laughs> you know, I went into a meeting, and it was like I do. If, if I go in, and there are certain things about meetings and when I'm, it's a new situation and I don't know the people and I'm not sure if I should even be there, I go in there and I'm in the middle of a meeting of people I don't know that well. And, you know, you salute the house. If the house is worthy, let your peace be upon it. And if it's not, let your peace return to you. Well, you know, you go in, there's usually people that have good spirits about them. Their spirits are good. You don't see too much guile and your peace can be upon it. But, I, you know, I go to meetings and I, they, they, they say things and do things and I'm, I'm with it. You know, my peace is on on. And then they turn on and they'll just say something else and whoop, my peace returns to me. Oh, Ooh, oh boy. But it's, it's, it's their meeting. It's like I was invited there. I'm not going to go in and barge in and start trying to knock their little house down. I'm going to feel things out. I'm going to be careful. I'm going to give it time. I'm going to observe it. I'm not going to judge it before the time. I'm just going to let it unfold and get a real good scope of what's going on. But everybody's in some kind of different level of attainment, right? Absolutely. Until I know what what their what what is attained, what someone else has attained, and what really God requires of them, regardless of what of what I think they should be doing, then I, I will go carefully. But anyway, I just found that uh, some certain ironies there. Yeah, yeah. Let me read this in, in chapter seven, and it'll make my final point on the mo handwriting of ordinances of Moses is handwriting. It's n Moses's writing, not God's writing. It is carnal, and it's not spiritual. As as Paul makes the distinction in Romans that the law is spiritual. All right. So chapter seven is talking about Melchizedek, and I'm not gonna. I'm gonna skip over a lot of things. But anyway. Or, uh, Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings meets Melchizedek. Melchizedek is actually Jesus Christ before he took on the likeness of sinful flesh. But he was Jesus Christ manifested in the form of a man, but not in the likeness of sinful flesh, because Jesus Christ was before all things, right? He was the beginning of the creation of God. 
only he wasn't known as Jesus yet. So Abraham gave him the tenth of all, and he was uh, without father, without mother, without descent, having no beginning of days nor end of life, but Melchizedek was like a son of God, abiding a priest continually. Well, who is like that? Who, who is the only entity that has no beginning or end? That's obviously, it's God, Jesus Christ. So that's who Melchizedek is. By the way, there's people, even when we were at the Overcomer Ministry, certain people challenged me, they, and certain Jews that say Melchizedek came from the lineage of Seth, and or whatever, something. Mm-hmm. Impossible. Now, how can they ignore this clear, clear definition of Melchizedek? They that are the sons of Levites who receive the office of a priest have have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them that receive tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises, and without all con- contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them of whom it is written that he liveth. And as I so say, Levi also, who receive tithes, paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Now we can go into the spirituality of that. Levites were, Levites were in the loins, so when Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, Levites were in the loins and fulfilled it with him. It's just because they didn't pay tithes. Levites didn't. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. Right. <laughs> Old Testament high priest was Melchizedek. Then he, God changed it. He made it Jesus Christ. Right. He became the high priest. Did away with the uh, lineage of Aaron representing high priesthood. Even made a change uh, with Melchizedek. Thou art a priest forever, my son. God swore by an oath. He sealed it with an oath. Remember I said when God swears, when he seals it with an oath, when God makes an oath. That's it. Done. 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 So God swore by an oath and he will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That's what he said about Jesus. Change of priesthood. So if there's a change of priesthood, there's a change in the law. It's not going to be Torah anymore. It's going to be law of liberty, law of Christ. Amen. Are you with me on this? Yeah. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. It is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And it is far yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there ariseth another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment. So Melchizedek's priesthood, even though he was a spiritual priest, his priesthood was after the law of a carnal commandment. Yes. So he's made not after the law of a carnal commandment, Jesus, but after the power of an endless life, for he testifieth, Thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the covenant of the commandments. There is a disannulling of the commandment going before because it's weak and unprofitable. Disannulling. I said before, the other preacher I was talking about, I named him, on, I'm not going to name him tonight. But people justify polygamy and the part, part of their uh, argument is they say, well, you know, because people say, well, you know, the, the polygamists say, well, look, David had wives and concubines and so on. They go on. And I would have given you more such things. So you see, the men of God had concubines in those days, so we can have multiple wives. Well, Paul didn't say that. Jesus didn't say that. And so then how do they get around that? They say, well, you think that Paul and his epistles trumps what's an Old Testament law? No way! <laughs> and I say, duh. Yeah, it does. It absolutely trumps what's in the old law. Old commandment, the old law, the old covenant... Weak unprofitableness, it is disannulled. Let every man have his own wife. Let every wife have her own husband. Paul says Christ is, uh, the marriage is Christ in the church. One bride, one bridegroom, on and on you go. The two shall be one. From the beginning it was not so, Jesus said. Everything in the New Testament points to a single man and a single woman in a godly marriage. No compromises, no exceptions, no, nothing, nothing, nothing. That is emphatic 
unchangeable part of the New Testament covenant, unchangeable, unimmutable, sealed, absolute, no exceptions. People got to get the law thing right in their perceptions. You got to understand the law thing. The law made nothing perfect. What law is he talking about? Well, no law makes anything perfect except the law of liberty, the law of the Lord. The law made nothing perfect, bringing him out of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. And so much as not without an oath was he made priest, for those priests were made without an oath, Aaron, Aaron's priesthood. But this, Jesus, with an oath, by him that said, The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made surety of a better testament. And they truly were many priests, because they were not suffered continued by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood, whereby he is able to save to them to the uttermost, them that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such a high priest became us, this is where Melchizedek couldn't help you. Melchizedek was in the form of a man, but what does he know about being tempted? Huh? What does he know about overcoming? What does he know about suffering? What does he know about learning obedience by the things he suffered? But Jesus now, Jesus, he went through his apostleship. So what did he do? He became us. He became everything that we would have to go through. Why? Because he had to be qualified to lead us to perfection, and he had to be able to help us and succor us and uh, aid us and encourage us and convince us that we can do this. And how could we be convinced if we had a high priest? You know, if it was just Melchizedek, I could say, well, how do you know Melchizedek? You know what it's like suffering temptation in the flesh. See, I'd have a point, right? I'd have a point. He doesn't. But not, not Jesus. See, he's able to the uttermost. Right. You've got to understand, Jesus knows. He knows it all. You know, he knows what you're going through. He lived through it. Such a high priest became us. He's holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, higher than the heavens, who need not daily as those high priests offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity. But the word of the oath, the swearing of God, which was since the law, maketh the Son, who was consecrated forevermore. So, what do you want to be? You want to be a son of Abraham? That isn't going to do you any good, is it? The rich, the rich man died and went to hell. He said, Father Abraham! He was a son of Abraham. What do you want to be? A son of a Pharisee? A product of the law? No, you got to become, just like Jesus, a son the law will make men of infirmity. The oath, the promise, we're children of promise. That makes us sons of God, led of the Spirit. And again, to give credibility to a certain extent to the law and to the, the Torah, we will fulfill the righteousness that is in the law. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Love the Lord. Love Him. All your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang... Okay. Now, the final thing. Luke. I'm starting in Luke 10 and Luke 18. Both make the same point. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is in the law? What is written in the law? How readest thou? Now, he doesn't say law of Moses. He says, what is written in the law? How readest thou? And the lawyer answers and says, listen, listen to what he quotes, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. That doesn't say everything I want to say about it, but this next part does. Luke 18. You also see it in Mark 10. I'll turn both just in case one says something, the other doesn't. Mark 10. All right. So in Luke 18, a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? This is the rich, rich man. He's a rich ruler. It doesn't say he's tempting him here. Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one. That is God. 
Thou knowest the commandments. That's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, you know the commandments. You're a ruler of the people. You, you're in the, in the scriptures all the time. Now, I kind of mock this a little bit to make the point, as a lot of preachers do. Sarcastically say the opposite of what's really happening to prove the point. What does Jesus say? Thou knowest the commandment. Don't eat pork. Pay your tithes. Get circumcised. No, he doesn't say any of that. No reference to any handwriting of ordinances of Moses at all. At all. None. He says, Thou knowest the commandment. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and mother. And he said, All these have I kept from my youth up. Let me say something else sarcastically. Just because Jesus stated five and left the other five alone, does that mean only these five are required and you're off the hook for the other Boy. five? <laughs> all right. Point made, right? He says, oh, all these I've kept from my youth up. And then Jesus heard it. He said, you're lacking one thing. Sell all that you have. Not 10%, see? All that you have, distribute to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that, he was very sorrowful and said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God, for it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And when they heard it, they said, Who can be saved? Things that are impossible with men are possible with God. And as we said before, if you think God has done away entirely with what's on the tables of stone, if you think it's the tables of stone was nailed to the cross, tell you, the tables of stone were not nailed to the cross. And I'll go further. Anything in the Torah that talks about morality, virtue, holiness, righteousness, good Christian conduct and character, that wasn't nailed either. It was all the ritual stuff. That's like I said, it's all the ritual stuff. Circumcision, tithe, divorce, feast days, dietary laws, washing pots and pans, what a that gone. That's not what's required of you. But you can still use the Torah if you use it right. So I'm making a distinction between what describes the divine nature, what's virtuous and holy and pure and righteous, as, as the Torah may describe, and ritual types of ordinances and carnal ordinances imposed upon them in the Old Testament that are now done away with. That you cannot hold them as requirements and let no man judge you in respect of those things. Oh, as I said before, and some people say Colossians, God God took the handwriting of ordinances of Moses that was contrary and nailed it to the cross. And some people actually believe that they that God took the Ten Commandments and nailed it to the cross. And they'll go around and say, we're no longer under the law. Like it has no relevance. It has no application. The righteousness is described isn't really required. Is that what you're saying? Oh, it's required. So here's what I here's how I apply it to this particular thing with the rich ruler. Now he kept all the commandments. Now people think, and now here's what I'm saying. People think that, oh, we're under grace. All that old stuff isn't required. Well, it's not that it's not required. The righteousness of Christ that it describes is required. Yeah, we have to fulfill what the Ten Commandments say, but it's, it's, the question is, how do we attain it? How do we get there? Mm-hmm. Self-will? Then that's no good. By faith in the operation of God? Well, that's, that's how what we're supposed to do. Then we're doing it out of charity, right? So people get the idea, oh, grace is slacker than law. Because if we pick up sticks on the Sabbath now, we don't get stoned to death. Right? If I commit adultery now, I don't get stoned to death right away. It's Grace is slacker. No, the Lord's not slack like you count slackness. No, we've been given more. We've been given the Holy Spirit, the divine nature. We've been given more. More is required. The rich ruler here says, Oh, I kept all these commandments from my youth up. So the Ten Commandments have not been totally done away with, have they? The requirement to fulfill them has not been done away. It's just the method of how you fulfill them becomes very, very important and critical and necessary. How you fulfill it. So people, uh, like if you fail of this age of grace, right? If you fail to produce the righteousness of God in your flesh in this age of grace, what does Hebrew say? Of how much sorer punishment. We're going to get it worse. 
because we've been given more. So what do we say then? Jesus is saying now in this story to the uh, rich ruler, he's saying, yeah, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to be saved and inherit eternal life? Keep the commandments. Which ones? The Ten Commandments. Not only that, the Ten Commandments plus. The Ten Commandments, the people think it's no longer required, it's done away with. No. The age of grace is even more required. Now in the Old Testament they had the Ten Commandments, but now Jesus is saying, well, keep the commandments plus, 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 plus. Give up all you have. Everything. Everything. Give to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven. And follow me. And pick up your cross. Praise God. And deny yourself. And follow me into the cup of sufferings. Amen, brother. Not only do you have to do the Ten Commandments, you've got to do the Ten Commandments. Plus. Now don't think this is uh, more slack than the Old Testament. Because it's grace. Because we don't get the sentence put on us immediately. The, the sentence does not get put on us immediately to give us the opportunity to work all this stuff out. Yep. So what if you don't work it out? Well, you're worse than the Old Testament. It's like Billy Graham's wife said, if God doesn't judge America, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? Woe unto you, Chorazin, woe unto you, Bethsaida. The mighty works that were done in them, have been done in you, before you, of the, the, them, the mighty works I did for you have been done in them, they would have repented. Sackcloth and ashes. Now they get the sore punishment. The sore punishment. Well, there you go. In Mark 10, when he was gone forth into the way, there came out one running and kneeled to him, saying, Good Master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There's none good but one. God. You know the commandments, don't commit adultery, don't kill, don't steal, don't bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. I guess there's six there, right? Two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Do not commit adultery, kill, steal, false witness, defraud not, honor father and mother. All these I have observed from my youth up. And then Jesus beholding him, loved him. You see, and this is what I'm saying, uh, There's whether people are law keepers or whatever they are, to a certain extent, it, it's it's nice when you can have a witness that the divine nature. It's not just simply trying to pick a fight. It's not that you're just trying to pick a fight. Right. If you understand the app, tra- proper applications of law here, absolutely. And this is what you guys you guys aren't going to be saved if you go this route. Right. You know, Jesus loved them. There was a zeal there. Yes. They were trying. There's something in there that was in pursuit of something Help one godly. All. Help them all. Praise God. One thing thou lackest, go thy way. Sell whatever thou hast, give to the poor, thou shalt treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross. Yes. And follow me. And follow me. That's, that's what's not in Luke. Yep. But it's here. Take up the cross and follow me. Yep. Oh, he was sad at that saying, and grieved, for he had great possessions. Jesus looked round about and said to his disciples, How hardly, so they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. The disciples were astonished. And, well, who can be saved then? Like, nobody can be saved. The disciples went through that, right? Lord, here's the, he kept all the commandments. And... <laughs> all right, so you see the point? Law. When you see the word law, when you see Jesus referring to law, what, what, the, you see why I make a distinction between handwriting of ordinances and tables of stone? Because Jesus made the distinction. The scriptures make the distinction. They're two different, they're covenants. I, I mean, yeah, or there, there are two different covenants, Amen. Old Testament and New. And it's based on the idea that righteousness, the purity of the righteousness of God, must, must, must come from within. The kingdom of God is within you. I'll put my law in your hearts and it'll come out from there. If you accomplish righteousness from an external carnal ordinances opposed upon you, you have missed the righteousness of God. You will not be saved like that. I'm not threatening you. No. Just telling you. So Jesus says, well, you know, keep the commandments. Is that really? What must I do to be saved? Keep the commandments. Which ones? Jesus told you which ones. Ten commandments. If you want to focus on what should be fulfilled in us, don't focus on feast days and stuff like that. Oh, but if you want to keep them properly or 
in the proper degree, that's one thing. But it's the Ten Commandments Jesus always, Jesus always pointed to. And everything else he said is not written in your law. It's not mine. Tor- Torah is not my law. It's not my law. How many believe my law is the law of liberty. Yes. The law of Christ. Yes. The law of the Lord. Amen. Walking in the fellowship of His sufferings. Amen. Always seeking to find out and attain to, the, to, to uh, renew my mind until I submit myself or endure the sufferings or the afflictions until the old man is dead, till I see... I have clear witness that righteousness is just a nature coming out of me. Yes. It's just a nature. Not because someone told me to do it. Yes. If I say, you must do such and such and such and such an activity. If I tell you, if I give you a rule like that, yes. are you conscious of what I said to you? Of course you are. And you're doing it by some deliberation of a rule coming from without. Well, what's the greatest characteristic of the righteousness of Christ in Matthew 25? When Jesus says, you know, Come, you uh, sheep on my right hand, enter into the joy prepared from you from the foundation of the world. For I was sick and you visited, I was in prison and you visited me. I was sick and you helped me and I was naked and you clothed me. I was hungry and you fed me. Uh, Lord, uh, what, when did we do this? Yeah. When did we see you sick? When did we, when did we come to prison? I, I've never been anywhere in a building with iron bars. Brothers and sisters, have we? <laughs> right? I've never given any food away. When did we? When did we do all this? He says, well, when you did it to the least of me, these my brethren. Absolutely. When it was the divine nature Absolutely. coming up from within your own heart, Absolutely. the love of God, shared and expressed and sh- communicated to one another. Yes. Not because somebody told you. Right. Praise God. You understand? Amen, brother. Praise I'm not. I'm not saying you'll go all your life never knowing that you fulfill the will of God. I mean, you will. But I'm saying, as a matter of principle, here are these people in Matthew 25. They, they weren't consciously keeping rules and laws, yet they fulfilled the righteousness, didn't they? It was a natural, it was a divine nature naturally working in them. It wasn't a deliberation of will and conscience. Right. It was a natural flowing issue of the Holy Ghost. They learned how to yield to it by nature. Sure. You follow me? Sure. That's perfection. That's what we're after. Yes, sir. Amen. That's where the law fails. All right. I'm done. That's it.